You're listening to the Let's Be Real podcast. Now, here's your host, Andy Hughes. Our guest right now is one of the top leaders at one of the top leadership companies in the world. As the CEO of all John Maxwell companies, he has over 25 years of experience in leadership and team development. We are absolutely thrilled to have Mark Cool on the Let's Be Real podcast. Mark, thank you so much for joining. How are you? I'm doing incredible, Andrew. It is an incredible honor uh, to be with you. Let, let me say this right at the beginning. The pressure that I feel to be the leader of a leadership legacy organization like the John Maxwell Company has to be a little bit like the pressure you feel to pull off technically a a podcast for SAP. I'm feeling you right here, man. The SAP is this global recognized brand. We use you guys. We train with you guys. And uh, man, you're doing a you're doing a podcast within a giant. And uh, it, hey, it's just good to share that with you, Andrew. Uh, glad to be here. <laughs> well, that certainly means a lot coming from you, Mark. And I can speak on behalf of SAP that we teach a lot of the concepts that, that come from the John Maxwell companies. So we just really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day to come on and talk with us. And I'd like to kind of start just getting to know you a little bit more. Would you mind telling our listeners a little bit about your path to your current role? Yeah, and, and so for those that don't know, John Maxwell's a speaker, writer. He's written over 100 leadership books. He's written more on the topic of leadership uh, than numbers two, three, and four as it relates to authors. And so, uh, John, I think his books are in the hands of 32 million people around the world, travels a lot. And uh, I started with this company. We have seven companies, two are nonprofits, that actually take his intellectual property. We instructionally design it to help companies like SAP, Delta Airlines, Microsoft, and others. And um, so I, I've been the CEO of our seven companies for the last nine years. I'm a business partner with John Maxwell, very blessed and very honored at the role that I get to serve on a daily basis. But Andrew, I'm really a product of the product. I came here 19 years ago as, as an entry-level telesales representative. I picked up the phone 100, 125 times a day, and I encouraged people to come to our events. I like to say I put butts in seats. And uh, so I did that for two and a half years. Um, I really did not at that point, and we may get into this a little bit later in the podcast, but I really didn't have an appetite to lead. I didn't want to lead. At that point in my life, I'd sworn off leadership. And so about three years in, they started giving me opportunity, started promoting me. And I've literally done most everything in the organization till. I guess John keeps trying to see if I can figure figure it out and, and find a role that I'll fill correctly. But yeah, the last nine years, uh, I've been the CEO. We had three companies nine years ago. We've now expanded to seven companies. And um, it's just been a journey and an effort of applying our content to my personal growth journey. And by doing that, I've increased my leadership and clear, increased my responsibility and I hope increased my value to John Maxwell and our companies. Well, I can definitely tell that you have made a huge impact on every John Maxwell company. And you talked a little bit about your journey there. Is leadership something that you always wanted to get into? Because, you know, I do hear from certain leaders that they say, oh, well, you know, I, I didn't really know if I wanted to be a leader. But then there are others that say that leadership is always something that they wanted to get into. Is that how it was for you? Yeah. And, and, you know, so I love, by the way, I love the title of your podcast, Let's Be Real, and that being responsiveness, empathetic, empathetic, aligned, leading. This idea of empathy, I have always wanted to be a leader, and let me tell you why. I grew up around leaders. My dad was a, a leader of a very well-respected nonprofit organization. Um, he then became a part of a, a the superintendent or the president of an association that served 165 nonprofits around the state of Georgia. And so leadership's in my blood. My mom's dad, my granddad started an orphanage, lived out of his a car for 480 plus days to raise funds for this children's home that's still available, are still open and, and, 
and serving the Tupelo, Mississippi area. So my, I've just been around leadership. It was, <laughs> it was five years old. I'm the baby of five, Andrew. It was five years old. All of my siblings are older than I, my oldest brother, 20 years older than my, me. And at five years old, I knew that I wanted to lead. And I'll tell you how. I loved at five years old telling people what to do. I, I just remember, man, I'd tell my older, older siblings what to do. I'd tell my parents what to do. I just love telling people what to do. But I tell you what I loved even more than telling people what to do. I loved it when they listened and they actually did it. I can remember at five or six convincing my family what we were going to eat or where we were going to go and this sense of fulfillment like I had just ran the show. So, yeah, I think I've had leadership in my blood all of my life. Wow, that's a very fascinating story. It's really cool that leadership has been with you your entire life, and it definitely shows in the way that you lead and the way that you make an impact. Obviously, becoming a CEO, there's a lot of development. There's a long journey. What were some of the things that you did to stand out to advance your career? Well, and, and, and people that represent the SAP brand will understand this. And then the podcast listeners that get to utilize and engage with SAP at some level will understand excellence. I mean, that's what you stand for. That's, that's what I think of when I think of SAP. That's what I think of when I think of the SAP team, excellence. And so one of the things that I have worked hard to do in my progression or in my growth to the corner office, so to speak, has been making sure that everything I do, I do it well. My dad used to say, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. And, and so I think excellence is one of the things that I've worked hard to employ as a growing, expanding leader. I think the second thing that is very important, especially for young people, it's, it's do not miss the value of hard work. I remember when I started with John, I was 30 years of age. Again, it was an entry level. I was starting life over. And um, I came to John. I was 30 years of age. I was working every, my leader, my leader's leader, and my leader's leader's leader. Three people above me, three iterations above me were younger than I. And, and I, you know, I was single. I was a bachelor. I, I didn't have a whole lot of life outside of work. But I remember I came in and I said, okay, what time does everybody start? I will be here well before anybody else gets here, and I will have already done some tangible, visible work. I remember looking and saying, hey, when does everybody leave? I will leave well after that, not just to show people, but to, to demonstrate a work ethic. So the second thing that I would tell you I've really employed uh, in my growth from entry level to senior level was hard work, um, excellence. And, and the third area is the value of influence. Now, I, I valued influence. Now, let me explain that. John Maxwell teaches everything rises and falls on leadership. That's one of his popularized statements. The second one is leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. And so if we believe that leadership is influence, then we don't wait for a position to begin to influence. We don't wait for a certain task or a certain set of responsibilities. We begin influencing no matter where we are, no matter what position, no matter who's above us, around us, below us. We work hard to expand our influence. So I've become a student of influence. And I say influence because too many people associate leadership and position and they become a student of the person above them. And need I say more by reminding some of us that we work for very poor examples of positional leadership. So I didn't look above me for models. I looked around me for ways to grow my influence. And so it would be really working hard on excellence, really demonstrating a work ethic that was um, the best I could do. And then finally, being a student of how to expand influence. Excellence, hard work, and influence. Love that. Absolutely love that. Thank you so much for sharing that, Mark, because I think those are three areas where no matter what role you're in, no matter what company you're in, those are three areas that you can control. So those are so write those three down. Those are very important. Excellence, hard work, and influence. Now, speaking of those three areas that we're talking about here, obviously becoming a CEO, there's a long journey. There's a lot of development that goes along the way. Did you have any moments 
where maybe people perceived some of the things that you did as a failure or did you have any challenges that you really had to learn from to develop into a CEO? I was thinking about it myself. To me, you can't succeed without failing or learning. You know, we should never look at something that doesn't go our way as a failure. We should look at it as an opportunity to learn and grow. Yeah, and I love that, Andrew, and I'll be honest with you. I, I'm a student of failure, and here's why. I've learned that I do it so much that I better be a student because if I don't become a student, I'm going to literally make it a profession. So I, I want to be a student of failure, not a professional at failure. And what I would really like to do, Andrew, is say, okay, tell me about your greatest failure and give me the best lesson you took from it. Because I'm a student. I really am a student of failure. But let me, let me tell you uh, a couple of moments in my life that have impacted me significantly that many people around me would have called a failure. I call it um, stepping stones to success. But, but it's really known as failure. I, I mentioned that I've been with John since I was 30 years of age. I've had two professions in my life. One was leading a significant nonprofit under my dad's leadership. And, um, man, I, I just really had a lot of personal failure at that point in my life. It caused so much struggle that I had to go and create and, and, and take another profession. So the, I came to John Maxwell's organization as a perceived failure. It's, not, it's interesting to note that the year I came to work with John, three months before I came to work on his team, he released the book, Failing Forward, How to Take Mistakes and Turn Them into Stepping Stones to, of Success. And that was a book he had just written. So I came being able to get in an environment that saw failure as an opportunity to step up into success. The second failure that I'll share with you, I, again, we could take the rest of the podcast and I could share a lot of failures with you. I've got, I've got a plethora. But a second one was, um, and this one is very applicable because I'm speaking to SAP, the technology leader of the world. And um, I, 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 we had a vision. John was releasing a book called Intentional Living. Great book. If you haven't read it, you need to pick it up. We felt like that book was going to not only become a million copy seller faster than any other book he had ever created, we also felt like we could create a community of intentional leaders and intentional livers with that book. And so uh, we put, uh, put $1.5 million into some technology that would allow us to accelerate the sales of that book and capture stories and build community around the content of that book. And I remember six months in, John looking at me and he said, okay, we're not fishing anymore, we're cutting bait. We've lost millions of dollars. And not only that, you've allowed technology to drive the vision for this book rather than the vision of this book to drive technology. And I'll never forget that lesson, Andrew, and, and I love technology. I'm honored to be on this call with you today. I really am. And to speak to your team, I, I, I'm honored. You guys are shaping and changing the world. But I learned a valuable lesson. Technology exists to serve a vision, not to be the vision. And uh, it cost us a lot of money. It was, it was millions of dollars, but I, I won't forget that lesson. Wow, those are some really, really inspiring stories. Thanks so much for sharing that. And I want to get to something that I saw in one of your blog posts. You said, if you can't bet on yourself, don't expect anyone else to. And I absolutely love that statement because it's really so true. How can you expect someone else to believe in you and bet on you when you don't even have that self-confidence. What does that statement mean to you and why do you think it's true? You know, we're in the training and development business. I love what you said right there, Andrew, because that mindset is what every senior leader wants to see in their in their up and coming leaders, in their staff that, that's wanting to grow. And that's this concept that says, leader, before you bet on me, let me show you how much I believe in myself. 
like I said, we're in the training and development business, and we, we call on people often saying, hey, we, we, we would like to build an intentional lit leadership plan for you. We would like to develop a pathway to increase the influence of your leaders, senior leaders, mid-level managers, and up-and-coming leaders. And uh, so many times we're talking to somebody and they say, oh, okay, thank you. Let me see if my company will pay for this training. And I've trained our team, stop them right there and say, wait just a minute, before you go talk to your leader, and we don't have a problem with the company paying for it, my question to you is, is do you see the value in this so much so that you would pay for it to better yourself, even if management doesn't? And you would be surprised, Andrew, at how many people stop, stumble, and hesitate with that question. And here's why. They want others to believe in them before they believe in themselves. They want others to pay to develop them, and they won't even pay to develop themselves. And so that's why I've developed this statement that says, hey, don't expect somebody else to bet on, your, on you if you won't bet on yourself. If you won't do what it takes to become better before you are recognized and advanced to a better position, don't be surprised when you keep, keep being looked over, passed over, and somebody gets promoted above you. I believe most of the time that we don't get what we want, it's because we don't see ourselves capable of doing that. We want others to see our capability more than we even see in ourselves. Wow, that's a very interesting take on that subject of training. And I really like how you ask people, would you be willing to spend your own money to develop yourself? That's really interesting because I never really thought about it that way. You're right. We really should have that confidence and be willing to do something for ourselves and, and help us develop into whatever we want to be. So that's that's a really important concept that you just described there. Now, earlier you mentioned things about excellence, hard work, things like that. What are some other qualities that make a great leader? There, there really is several. I want to key on um, two, if you will let me, Andrew. The first one is humility. I, I really do believe, now you and I, we work in a world that is filled with egotistical, self-absorbed leaders. I believe that fad of overconfident leadership is going away. I believe the next generation, the millennials that work for you and I, that work with you and I, I don't have people work for me, the, the millennials that work with you and I, they're done with egocentric leadership. They're done with it. I believe we're done with it politically. I think we're done with it religiously. I think we're done with it in business as well. We like confidence. We do not like cockiness. We, don't, we like people that are certain of themselves, but we don't like people that are, are absorbed with themselves. Just do a poll. People are turned off by that leadership, that style of leadership, even if they are successful. They would rather go work for somebody that's nowhere near as successful, but that is relatable. So I believe there is a humility. And humility is not about defaming or defacing yourself. It's about edifying and lifting others higher than yourself. So I don't put myself down to show humility. I lift people up ab around me, above me, to show my humility. So humility is not passive, it's active. And so I, I really do believe, I've heard John Maxwell teach it, I believe it fundamentally that humility is a key ingredient to sustainable, effective leadership in today's leadership economy. The second thing that I would say, Andrew, and it's very closely aligned with humility, but it's teachability. I believe the day that you have arrived at success to the point that others can't show you a better way is the day you have reached the apex and you have started decline. The day that you have nothing else to learn is the day that you are done. I love, John has a statement. I, I love the statement. It says, there's many people walking around dead. They just haven't made it official. In other words, they've accomplished everything they want to accomplish. There's no drive. There's no sense of purpose. There's no desire for better. Another statement that John makes lately that I love, you've heard Jim Collins say, the enemy of good, the enemy of great is good. In other words, when we do good, we stop short of great. 
a spinoff of that is I believe that best is the enemy of better. When we have a personal best, I'm a marathon runner. When I have a personal best and I settle on, I just had a PB, I had my personal best. It's hard for me to get back out there the next marathon and want to do better than my personal best. A leader that is experiencing the best of times many times don't push themselves to being better, and that's because they've lost teachability. The thing I try to interview for the most when I am involved in the interview process is teachability. How coachable, how teachable, how hungry is the person to learn and grow and improve? Humility and teachability are definitely important as well. And you have a unique opportunity because you get to work very closely with John Maxwell, who is always in high demand. He's always traveling. What is that relationship like? And what are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned from working with him? So nine years ago, um, I really believed that the formula for success for our company going forward was to keep the management of our companies close to the source of vision. So in other words, I, as the incoming manager of John's organizations, and remember I'd been here 11 years or almost 11 years, I believed what I learned from my predecessors were that they got too far from the visionary of the organization. Now, that's a mouthful for a lot of companies that may listen to this podcast and for sure the team divisional leaders of SAP that are listening to this podcast. The further you get from the source of the vision, the harder it is to direct the ship in the right direction. I guarantee it. I, I work with companies all the time. And when I see a fracture, when I see conflict, my first question is, is how clear is the vision, how repetitive is the vision, and how accessible is the vision to the operations? And so with, on that note, I made a decision, John made a decision that we would run the company for the foreseeable future with me as his CEO running companies, being with him 80% of the time he travels. Now, John's a traveling man. I mean, he travels all over the place. So I'm on the road with him 80% of the time. And the reason we did that is where I could be available to the source of vision and where I could be approximate to John and therefore run the companies from as close to the vision as possible. That being said, because I'm on the road with John 80% of the time, we have an incredible relationship. I mean, you got to imagine, for those of you that don't know John, Google him. But, I mean, he's in demand with presidents, heads of countries, heads of top Fortune 50 companies, speaks all around the world. And I get to travel with him and meet all those people I just mentioned. So the first thing that I would say, what's it like? It's like a fire hydrant. Every day I am learning something and being exposed to some leadership concept that most people never get exposed to. But I'll give you a couple of other dimensions and, and dynamics. I mean, he's a mentor of mine. He, uh, in many ways, I'm like a son to him. He, he's, a, he, he's an incredible teacher, mentor, boss. Um, but probably the greatest thing is partnership and friend. I mean, we just have a great time doing what we do. And I, I'm, I'm better for it. He mentors me. He, he challenges me. And then he empowers me to, to go run the companies. Now, you mentioned that he was a traveling man. I have to bring this trip up that you guys recently went on. It was you and John. Get this, everybody. This is unbelievable. Mark and John traveled to 19 airports, six countries, all in 17 days. Now, that is unbelievable. There are a lot of people out there that would stop at one day at an airport, let alone 19 airports in 17 days in six countries. That is unbelievable. What was that experience like and what lessons did you learn from it? Yeah, and let me give you two more stats that I don't know if was in the blog, but they're, they're true stats. We were in the air 54 hours of those 17 days. We were in the air or in airports 96 hours. That's four full 24 hour days. We were in airplanes or airports on that trip. And the first thing I would tell you what it was it like, exhausting. 
I mean, we, you know, John's at a stage in his life that he, he doesn't have to do what he's doing. He does it because he wants to. Um, and the first thing that I learned is this, when you really capture your heart's passion, you want to do it for the rest of your life. I mean, that is a pace that for a young guy, I call me young, my, 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 my producer in our studio here is kind of laughing right now at me calling myself young. But in relation to John, I'm young. And um, the, the, um, the funny thing is I learned in that, and I've been with John, again, 19 years. This last trip was about three months ago that you're talking about. And I learned that there is no finish line. In other words, when you're playing an infinite game, and John Maxwell is playing an infinite game, he wants to add value to people. There is no finish line in adding value to people. It's an infinite game. And so we learned on this trip, there is no finish line, and we exhausted ourselves to demonstrate there was no finish line. You know the other thing, Andrew, about that particular trip? We got to go to Iran is the way I say it in the South. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, for those of you that can't tell. But Iran, 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 that was one of the countries that we went to. That was one of the places that we went. John is at a place, we're at a place to where I'm speaking on stage with John. So I got to speak to about 1,500 CEOs, top business leaders in Iran. Now, here's what's interesting about that, Andrew. That was four days, for those of us in the U.S., you will remember this, that was four days after a um, drone was shot down right off of the Iran or the Iranian coast. The State Department was not super excited about us going to this event. Our staff, specifically our executive assistants, were not excited about us going, but we, we really felt like we had committed to go, and we felt like we needed to go. And by the way, we felt very safe. The Iranian people are astounding, hungry, generous loved us. But here was the thing that was really encouraging to me. I watched John, and I got to play a part of this, defy what the world was telling us about the relationship of two cultures, two different people groups. And we got to defy that and speak a common language of valuing people, adding value to leaders. And these people came up with tears in their eyes and said, thank you for coming and adding value to us. We've read your books, John. We've been impacted by you. But that you would come in such a time of chaos and uncertainty and add value to us speaks more than any of your books ever had. Here's what I learned from that, Andrew. People around the world, generational, diversity, culturally, gender, Everybody just wants somebody that will value them enough to do something significant that add value that adds value to them. Well, that is so inspiring to hear a story like that, and and I'm sure that trip made such an impact on you. Uh, even just listening to it is just so inspiring. So thanks for sharing that and going into detail with that. I want to backtrack a little bit, though. I do want to go back to something that you did previously. You have a unique perspective on this. You worked both in a not-for-profit sector and in a profit sector. What are some of the similarities between the two, and what are some differences between the two? Well, let me let me give you um, the differences first, although I think there's very few differences. I think the differences are more intuitive than they are substantive, and let me explain. You know, a nonprofit typically rallies people around mission or vision or, or purpose, and they, they really drive that. And they, they feel obligated to people because people are giving philanthropically to them, and they're, they're there because the people have caught the vision and caught the heart. And so there's this symbiotic relationship between the donor and the, the, the carrier of the vision or the purpose. And, and, it, and it's a real nice thing. There's a real connection. Um, for, for profit, you just make sure that you extend value, that your product is valuable enough, that people appreciate your value, that it was worth the value extension, and, and, and off we go. And, and we see that much more transactional in the business community, and we see it much more missional in the nonprofit world for the most part. Even though I stated that as differences, I really don't believe it's as different as you think, because here's what I believe. I believe that People should give the same way they invest. 
I, I, I love to give. I, we, my wife and I, we've committed to give more each and every year from a percentage standpoint. So I, I believe in generosity. I believe the person that has a lot should be willing to give a lot. I mean, I, I, I can give you a hundred ways of why I believe that generosity is really important. But I believe that generosity should be treated just like investment. And let me explain. If people would give expecting an ROI, like they invest expecting an ROI, we would do really good for the nonprofit organizations that are out there changing the world. The problem is, is we give out an obligation, guilt, or relationship many times, and we leave our business cap off when we write from our giving accounts. And I wish we wouldn't do that because nonprofits should be held to KPIs just like businesses should. There should be key performance indicators. We should, in fact, I believe if you have a mission that is compelling and helping mankind and making a difference, I believe you should treat that more important than somebody that's out there, forgive me, selling cell phones or selling a hamburger or something like that. Your mission, if it is valid, is significantly more important to mankind than some of the trinkets, trinkets and things that we sell at the, at the corner store. So I, I, I wish and I believe that there should be a symbiotic relationship to KPIs with nonprofit and for-profit. Thirdly, I believe that the staff of a nonprofit should produce just like the staff of a for-profit. If you don't contribute to the bottom line, you need to go find something somewhere that you can contribute to the bottom line. And I believe if we would run nonprofits like businesses, we would be a lot more successful at things that in the long run is probably more important than the for-profit entity. Let me say one more thing. John talks about, and, and really the millennials, this next generation of leaders coming up really gets this probably better than, all, than, than any previous generation, even though we have a life, we have a lifetime of generosity, especially in the U.S., I believe that we should all be pursuing significance, which a lot of times significant things are done in the nonprofit space. It is for us. We, we do all of our significant work in the nonprofit. So there's a difference between success and significance. We all pursue success a lot of times in the business community. We pursue significance many times in the nonprofit community. Let me. What we believe the difference is is success. Is what is what happens to us? Significance is what happens through us. Success is about our climb to a point, a pinnacle, a goal. Significance is about us helping others climb to a point of success, a pinnacle, or a goal. And uh, I, I, what I'm very encouraged about. Again, the, the millennials, this, the, the, our, our young people's getting a real hard slam with media and other things. Are they going to amount to anything? Is there anything out there? And I, I am super encouraged because I believe my kids have a greater propensity to do things for others than my generation or my parents' generation. And so I, I think all of our companies, I mean, SAP, they're doing significant things. In other words, they're trying to not only sell their business, they're trying to take what they sell and do good for the globe. And I'm thankful for that. That's very interesting. Now, I want to switch gears again here because one thing that we talk a lot about at SAP is alignment. And in the B Real, that's what the A stands for, alignment. And I want to talk to you a little bit more about that because from what I understand, you were involved in a merger during your career. I have to think that was a big challenge for you. How were you able to transition multiple companies into one culture? That's not an easy task, is it? You mentioned the word there, um, and alignment is such a big deal. I love what you're doing with Let's Be Real. Because that is the biggest challenge. There's two big, the, the two biggest challenges that I've had in my professional career with John Maxwell has been a merger. And we're in the middle of a pretty big one right now. And then it's been redefining, reimagining a successful 
organization. That This happened to be a nonprofit, but it's happened in the for-profit space too. When you take a successful organization and you begin to reimagine what the future and what results should look like, you have, in my opinion, one of the greatest leadership challenges there is. Because you're taking a group of people that's already succeeding, already doing well. They have a lot of trophies on the shelf, and you're telling them, one, it's not good enough. Two, it's not going to work in the future. Three, can you change enough because good, because again, best is the enemy of better. And that, that's a, that was a real big challenge for me. We've done that, and I, I'm really thankful I could tell that story. Maybe another day we will. But back to your question on a merger, what, what you're doing is, again, you're either there is a reason a company has been acquired. They're either doing so well that another company wants to benefit from how well they're doing, which gives the acquired company a feeling of superiority when they're coming in and now they're owned by somebody else. And that somebody else is going to tell them how they need to do something different. And they're resistant because they were doing so good you wanted to buy me. That's one reason. That's not a fun merger. You buy a company that's bigger, better, faster, doing greater things than you, and now you're going to instruct them a new way of doing things. It's the last thing a group of successful women and men want to hear. The second merger, many times, and not every merger falls into these two categories, but a second merger is, is the company is struggling, and there's a fire sale, or there's a discounted sale, or there's, there's a need for something different. And so you're bringing this group of women and men that already feels like they are inadequate. They've not been doing what they needed to do. And now you're going to show them from almost an elitist or a superior perspective on how, why they are such a failure. Let me tell you what you've been doing wrong. And if you do it my way, you're going to now be successful. Again, people can know they're doing wrong, but they don't want you to tell them they're doing wrong and remind them every day as you go through changes and, and challenges that come with every merger. So in the mergers that I've been a part of, both as a participant and then as a consultant or an instructor, the biggest thing that you've got to do is you've got to get clarity. This is why we merged this is what we hope to accomplish because we're merging, and this is the role you're going to play to get us to this clear, envisioned future. And in every merger, you need to do that. You need to be very authentic, very real. This is why we're merging. This is the expectation from the merge, and this is the role you can play to get us to the envisioned future. It was really fascinating to hear you just talk about the two types of mergers. I hadn't really thought about the two types of mergers that could come up, and it was interesting to hear you explain the differences there. Now, when we talk about mergers and we talk about transitioning in a merger, the word culture came up. What, in your mind, are the keys to creating a healthy culture? Because that is so important now in today's world. There needs to be a good culture where people feel empowered and they feel positive. We believe there are three major components to culture, and, and let me give those, and I'll speak a little bit about that, and then if you want to go even deeper in culture, Andrew, we certainly can. We believe that culture consists of three things. Done well will give you the encouragement and the motivation and the lift that culture should provide for the strategy and the structure of the organization. The first component is a common language. So when we go in, people say, hey, we, we're going to invest in the leadership acumen, the leadership level of our staff, and we want you, the John Maxwell Company, to help us. We go in, the first thing that we do is in relation to leadership, we determine what is the current culture's perspective of leadership. And you'd be surprised. We do this in Africa. We do this, we do this in our nonprofit. What is your perception of leadership? And I mean, you, you can imagine the range of descriptors that we get, that, that decisive, selfish, indulgent, hierarchical, servant, selfless. I mean, it, it's across the range of, of, of motion or uh, the range of emotion. And so then we go, how much, what's your appetite to learn and to be a leader in this environment? And again, it, it's all over the place. If the perception of leadership is bad, the appetite, to, the appetite to lead is low. 
If the perception is high, the appetite to lead is high. So in other words, there's a common language that you must establish in your culture to make sure that what people are saying matches what they're doing, matches what leaders are seeing for the future. You've got to create a, a thread. That thread is what we call common language. Is everybody saying the same thing? And is everybody on the same page? The second component of culture is um, beliefs, common beliefs. So common language, common beliefs. It, are we all believing the same thing for our future? Are we all showing up every day for the same reason? Do we have a belief that we're making a difference? Do we have a belief that our product is superior? Do we have a belief that excellence is celebrated in this environment? What's the common beliefs of the organization? The third component of culture, of a healthy of culture, period. You, then you work on these things to get healthy culture. The third component is common behaviors. Are we going to celebrate people? Are, are we going to celebrate, neglect, or address people that show up whenever they want to? People that don't respect others on the team. People that haphazardly create our product and have a low quality standard. What is the common behaviors that are going to be celebrated, corrected, and addressed in this, in this environment? And when you can get everyone saying the common language, the common beliefs, the common behaviors, and you can get those synced up, then you can begin tweaking and making that culture more healthy, more motivational, more inspirational, and absolutely more productive. Common language, common beliefs, and common behaviors. Love that. And you know what all those things have in common? The word common. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why alignment is so critical to any business, because you really need to be speaking the common language, have the same common beliefs, and have those same common behaviors. That's so important. Now, we've talked a little bit about mergers. We've talked about the keys to creating a healthy culture. Another challenge with leadership is implementing change. What are some tips that can help organization leaders implement changes the right way? Yeah, you know, there's this misnomer that the only people that likes change is leaders. The leaders love change. I'm a, I'm a change agent. And I, I don't believe that. In fact, I've heard John Maxwell teach often this point that I'm getting ready to make to you. And that is the truth is nobody likes changes. But only the people that can control the change, in other words, their, it's their change, really are the ones that embrace change. So in other words, nobody likes change unless it's their change. And then they can get behind it and embrace it. I mean, I, I've had John Maxwell, I'm the CEO, John's trusted and empowered leader, and John has put changes on me that I did not like because I didn't get to speak into the validity of the change. My point, I'm CEO, I don't like change unless it's my change, and then I want everybody to embrace change. So I think the first thing that I would tell you is make sure you everyone understands no one likes change. Now, let me flip that and tell you that change is necessary. Change should be liked because the only organizations that's not changing are the organizations that are in decline because they're using yesterday's policies, yesterday's visions, and less yesterday's procedures, and everything has become status quo. John says this, growth is the only guarantee that tomorrow will be better. Now that's on personal growth, but let me bring that back to change. Growth is change. Growth requires change. And growth is the only way to get better. By deduction, I believe that change and the people's ability to make change productive is the only way to keep a growing, thriving, sustainable business or nonprofit. So the, the two things that I would tell you and leave with you on change is one, change is not appreciated by anybody unless they are the author of the change. Two, change is necessary if you want improvement. Now, to a couple of other things that I would say on change 
is many people want to eliminate change. They don't want to manage change. They actually want to be a change eliminator, not a change manager. We, we embrace change as if it is a task with a finish line. And I believe that's the wrong perspective. I believe we should embrace change as an opportunity to get better, not as a task to get done. And if, I, and if we can get that fundamental belief of change into the hearts and minds of all the people on our team, then we can start putting in the policies, the processes, the systems that's going to require people to change. But many times we bring change to the table and never give context on why the change is happening, what the change is expected to bring, what is the win, and how the change is going to impact you before it starts impacting so my problem with change is we don't do enough pre-work to explain, give context, and give identity to how the change is going to impact rather than we just come and we've got an idea and we're ready for everybody to implement and embrace our change. We do a lot of change management around here, a lot of training, and we spend a lot of time on getting people ready for change before we push the change on them. Well, I think that's definitely the best strategy because that allows everyone involved to be a part of the change. And it also allows them to understand how the change will affect them and what changes they need to make in their daily lives. So that's a great strategy. Now, earlier you mentioned that as individuals, we should not have a finish line. It's an infinite game and we have unlimited potential. I would say the same thing applies to organizations though as well, because as an organization, you need to constantly reevaluate and see where you're at in order to produce better results. Even if you're the greatest company in the world, if you're just sitting there and not reevaluating yourself, another company that is doing that is going to jump right over you. So how important is it for an organization to also have the belief that there is no finish line and that we need to constantly reevaluate our processes to get the best results possible? Boy, I, I love what you just said there, Andrew, about people and people not wanting change or people wanting sustainability, but there's got to be organizations that really embrace that. And I think that comes with evaluation. You know, John, John makes a statement often. He says, people don't quit companies or organizations. People quit people. People don't give extra for organizations. People give extra for people. And, and I, and, and I, again, I, I lead seven organizations. I, I appreciate the entity. But at the end of the day, the entity is a composite of its people. And, and what, I, what I would tell you is company evaluation or re-evaluation really happens as we re-evaluate the people that are on the team and their ability to help the organization get to the vision that we're, we're trying to accomplish. And so we, we, you know, we do 90 day assessments, we do year end reviews, we do all of those tools and I love them. We have another couple of tools that again, on another podcast, I'll, I'll talk to you about our PPFs. What is the personal, professional, financial goals of the people on your team? If I really challenge people to evaluate the per performance of the company by evaluating the performance of the people. Many times we, cre we keep organizational effectiveness and people effectiveness separate as if they're not one and the same. And my, my best advice to give you in reevaluating an organization or constantly reevaluating and assessing success is to make close the gap between organizational effectiveness and people effectiveness. Shrink that disconnect, and I, I believe you will be much greater and more effective when you do evaluate and reevaluate needed changes for the future vision. Absolutely. Evaluations are so important. And another thing that's very important is this statement that I just heard. The statement was, life gets easier when you do the hard stuff. It took me a moment to think about that and realize, wow, that is so true. When I think about that statement, I think about what life would have been like if I just kept doing the same thing over and over and over, and I didn't really challenge myself. And 
I don't know where I would be if I did that because I wouldn't be growing, I wouldn't be developing, I wouldn't be learning new things. When I think about this statement, it's true. Life does get easier when you work on the hard stuff. And it's not only for work, it's also personal things as well. You know, maybe there's something, there's a fear that I have and I'm just scared to attack it. But if I actually go out and do it, I feel accomplished, I've learned something, and now I can build on that. What does that statement mean to you? Life gets easier when you do the hard stuff. Well, I think it's an incredible statement, and I think the context you gave for that statement, Andrew, is worth the weight of this podcast, this episode. And I hope you guys grabbed it. As it relates to life getting easier when you do the hard stuff, John Maxwell has two statements I want to leave with you. The first is everything worthwhile is uphill. Everything. Everything worthwhile is uphill. And it's uphill all the way. You know, many of us are willing to do the hard stuff in our 20s, maybe in our 30s. We're willing to do the hard stuff for two years. We're willing to, okay, I'll pay the price for 15 years, but by then I want to be the top whatever, whatever. The challenge is in leadership, it's uphill all the way. We don't get to a place. You're, you, the problem is everybody wants uphill. They have uphill dreams. They have uphill aspirations. They see something up there that they want to attain. But our problem is, Andrew, we have downhill habits. We want to go uphill, but we're more comfortable when we're coasting. You don't coast uphill. I've never met somebody that was successful that said, oh, my gosh, I, I just woke up today and I became successful. No, talk to anybody that has reached a level of success and they can tell you every painstaking moment of the journey. But we look at success and we idolize it, but we don't accessorize it. We don't put accessories on that success that will give us handles that will help us climb that mountain, that will allow us to go uphill. And so everything worthwhile is uphill, and it's uphill all the way. Now, it sounds like I'm contradicting life gets easier when you do the hard stuff. I believe what you just said about that statement and what I just said is ab absolutely symbiotic or, or simpatico, sorry. I believe it is simpatico, and let me tell you why. Once you settle in your mind that I am on an infinite climb, to success, to fulfillment, to significance, to meaning. Once I realize I'm on that uphill climb, it gets easier. I quit looking for the plateau. I quit looking for the days to where something's going to get a little easier. Let me tell you this. Count the cost of any dream you have. Anticipate the timeline for any dream you have. Trust me, it's going to cost you more and it's going to take you longer. Because anything worthwhile is uphill. Anything worthwhile is going to require more of you than you anticipate on the front end. The question for you and me is not how bad do we want it, even though we think that's a very important question to answer. The question is, are we willing to keep going until we get it? And when we get it, are we willing to keep going so that it impacts others? John Maxwell recently was, was doing an event with Tyler Perry, the actor, just a brilliant human being. He's impacted the whole Atlanta landscape. And John was talking to Tyler about this fourth studio that he's built at an old army base in downtown Atlanta called Fort McPherson. And, and I mean, he is employing thousands, tens of thousands of people. And Tyler told the story. He said, you know, John, after I finished the first studio, I thought, okay, I've done it. I've made a name for myself. And then I had the opportunity to build the second one. And then I built that one bigger. And I said, okay, I finally arrived. Now people are taking me serious. He said, then I felt compelled to build the third one. And by then I was now seeing it impact others. And I felt like I was done. I wanted to go home, spend time with my son and be done. And he said, John, it was at that moment that I realized the injustice that I would do for others if I stopped at that third studio. 
So I was compelled, not by money, not by fame, not by busyness. I was compelled that for others, I needed to build the fourth studio. It was in that conversation with Tyler Perry that John developed this thought. When you can afford to quit, you can't afford to quit. When you have arrived, really now you need to get going for the others that will be impacted by your status, by your influence. In other words, today's ceiling of success is tomorrow's floor to significance. And I, I think that's what, what I'm trying to illustrate with you is everything worthwhile is uphill. But Andrew, once you get an uphill mindset, it gets much easier as you get going, that this is the journey that I'm going to take in my leadership. Wow, that's a really cool story, the Tyler Perry story. Thanks for so much for sharing that. Now, before we wrap up here, Mark, where can people find more information about what you are doing and what the John Maxwell companies are doing? Well, the first thing I would tell them, Andrew, is keep hanging out with Andrew and the Let's Be Real podcast. And I mean that. I, I'm, I'm privileged to be on your platform sharing with your people. I, I don't do this every day. I, I say no to a lot more than I say yes to. But what you're doing and what SAP is doing is worth following. So the first thing that I would say, absolutely, is you need to subscribe and be a part of the Let's Be Real podcast podcast. I mean, you you need to be a, an active participant in this community. You need to tell others. You need to get more people subscribing to what Andrew is doing. Now, as it relates to what we're doing at the, in the John Maxwell Enterprise, the first thing is our website, johnmaxwell.com. You can go there. You can get John Maxwell books. You can find out more about our corporate training solutions where we'll come in and help team effectiveness, organizational effectiveness, leadership development, personal growth, we have uh, all of those solutions on the johnmaxwell.com um, website. The other thing that we're doing, John Maxwell and I are just having the time of our life. Just a couple of weeks ago, we had Marcus Buckingham, Carly Fiorina. Uh, John and Maxwell and I are having the time of our life on our podcast. You can go to it at maxwellpodcast.com. And again, it's the John Maxwell Leadership Podcast. If you want to go to iTunes or, or Apple or, or whatever podcast um, platform that you use, you can go there. Um, that, that's probably the two biggest places you can connect more with what we're doing is, is uh, johnmaxwell.com and the Maxwell podca maxwellpodcast.com. Awesome. Well, to all the listeners out there, definitely check that out. Check out their website. Check out their podcast. There's so much great content out there available to you. And we will include a link to both of those websites in the description of this episode so that you can check it out. Well, Mark, I feel like we could go on for days, so I really uh, appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to talk to us. So thanks again for joining us, and uh, best of luck with everything in the future. Thank you, Andrew. Again, good to be a part of the, the, the podcast that you're doing there.